turn it over to you. Uh, can you uh, present all right, Alex? Do you need anything else before you take over? Let's see. Does that show up? Let me pull you guys yep. back up so I can still see chat. Yeah. I can Sweet. see it. Cool. Great title slide. Um, awesome. So thanks for the, the intro there, Jason. Um, one thing I wanted to get out, out of the way ahead of time, if you have questions, literally unmute yourself and ask them or throw them in chat. I'm going to have you know, the chat right here. So I'm more than happy to answer questions as we go. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about uh, all sorts of cool things in accessibility and, and, and gaming and .NET and AI. Uh, and while Jason's intro is great, I do have my own intro slide. Um, so I'm Alex Dunham, the Chief Product Officer of Voiceify, and I'm also the creator of Enable Play, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, online, I'm Suave Pirate. Uh, basically, the reason is that Alex Dunn is a super generic name. Um, there are multiple Alex Dunns in the developer division at Microsoft. So even if you like look me up and you're like, Alex Dunn, who does the Microsoft development tech stack stuff, you might not even find me. Uh, so way back when, when I started sort of developing my internet presence a bit, went to a name generator, Suave Pirate is here, is here to stay, and it's too late to go back now. So uh, even on LinkedIn, you'll, I mean, my name is Alex Dunn there, but you can go to LinkedIn slash Suave Pirate, you'll find me there too. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP specifically in AI and in uh, developer tools. Uh, I do a lot of work with virtual assistants in voice and conversational AI. Uh, and I've been known to tell a few jokes at bars after conferences enough to win an award for it. Uh, so to move things along, this, this talk, you know, it's, it's called making every game more accessible using .NET and AI, uh, mostly because like this type of title is like way too big to, to fit in like a conference submission. But here's basically what we're going to do. We're going to talk about taking your side projects and actually turning them into products, how, how to, to develop your concepts into things that are, are a real product that help people and solve problems. We're gonna show you how to use that, do that using AI, do, do talk about some Python. We're gonna mostly talk in terms of code about .NET and C Sharp, uh, using Azure tools and, and the thoughtfulness and how you approach problems. Uh, and it's in story format specifically for how I developed Enabled Play. Uh, but we're also gonna be playing some video games with it and, and talk specifically about assistive technology. Uh, and at the sort of lowest level, uh, you know, we're going to go into sort of rethinking the the human computer interaction paradigm that we've we've lived in for the last you know seventy years almost. A uh, quick warning: there is some video game violence in this presentation. There's a couple videos of it. It's basically in fantasy RPG and first person shooters. There's a couple. I try to minimize it, but I like to call that out ahead of time. Uh, there, there's going to be Call of Duty and, and Dark Souls and Sekiro, basically. And at the end, when we get into live demos of using it in gaming, I'll leave it up to you with how much violence you want uh, and which demo we want to actually see come together. Okay, let's get it started. How many of you, by a raise of hands for those on video or by throwing something in chat, have seen this screen before in your life? Have, have come across this before? Okay, we've got a few of you. For those who don't know, this is probably the most common view uh, that you'll see in the game called Dark Souls. And Dark Souls is notoriously uh, referred to as the hardest game ever. Um, you know, it's it, there's actually a whole lot of drama on Twitter today because there's a new game uh, called Elden Ring, which is sort of like another game in the series. Uh, not technically the same exact series, but the same. And, and issues with Dark Souls and accessibility, not having difficulty settings. The whole thing is that it's really hard uh, to play. Now, Dark Souls is my favorite game, 100%. Uh, it is literally uh, the the game that I've played the most. I've played through it probably like 20 or 30 times. I bring my friends over. We do challenge runs. Uh, we we compete with each other. We even put wagers in in terms of who's going to do better in beating this game faster or with like a certain challenge. I love Dark Souls. Um, but one of the things that I came across is, uh, you know, I, I uh, was working with playing Minecraft with my, my youngest brother, who's much younger than me, um, and basically, you know, saw him struggling to play certain and do certain things in Minecraft. And I, and I sort of thought to myself, like, man, just controlling a video game is, is hard for certain people. And I kind of came to that realization that, like, this, like, Dark Souls, my favorite game, I, like, the thing I'm the most passionate about in gaming is just not even a thing that you know he can consider playing and and many others like him of course uh and so i thought well this problem is something that you know i can i can maybe help solve and so my first thought was what if i just made a bot that could help play dark souls for me something that could supplement what i'm doing in a controller or with uh, a mouse and keyboard 
And so this started this journey that I've gone through a few different times now with a sort of wild concept and trying to get something that becomes working software that actually helps solve that problem. Uh, and along the way, uh, there's going to be a lot of failures. And these are the sorts of things that I want to, to talk about today in terms of how we got there and the types of approaches we took uh, to eventually get to that point of working software. So I set up a couple of rules for myself, right? I'm going to help make a bot that helps me play Dark Souls. First things first, no hacks or mods. Can't actually change the game code. Can't apply updates to the, the game itself. No modding it. Uh, it. The concept has to be extendable to other games. Like while the, the original purpose was for Dark Souls, conceptually, it needs to be something that helps people play games in general. Uh, it has to be usable by other people. Uh, it's not built for me, uh, although I'm going to be the one building it and using it. And it has to actually work uh, and solve the problem. So the first thing I went to was image recognition. Uh, I've done a lot in computer vision before. Conceptually, I, I had this idea of, well, I could take each frame in the video while streaming you know, the, the, the actual video that's coming out of the game of Dark Souls and try to recognize certain patterns and then help make decisions for the character using like keyboard inputs. So basically, you know, at its lowest level, it looks like this. That's a big scary sword. It's right above our cool guy. So we should probably roll out of the way. Basic like decision making based off of image recognition. Um, and, and I got a, a nice little version of this running where I was able to train a model, just a, a custom computer vision model by just feeding it tons of gameplay and being like labeling it here. This is a bad guy. I'm in danger in this situation based on this frame and starting to recognize patterns to then try to make decisions. Uh, what I ended up finding uh, is something that I should have known from the beginning, which is that you're kind of like always in danger in Dark Souls. Uh, you're in danger from giant mushrooms that just kind of sneak up to you and punch you. There are things in the dark that you can't even see until it's too late. And then every boss is basically impossible to play. Uh, and on top of that, I also uh, basically cooked my graphics card and my CPU while trying to play a game at 60 frames per second uh, while also streaming each of those frames and running them through a model and then also trying to make uh, decisions on the fly. Uh, so this is my favorite little graphic of my little computer trying to, to uh, detect those evil punching mushrooms. So my next thought was, okay, other games, including Dark Souls, have combat music. If you're in danger, you can, you can sort of feel, it, and it's something that they do by design in a sort of immersive way, that the music gets scary, right? And so what I wanted to do is say, like, okay, well, what if I could just start detecting scary music by modeling that same approach and then use that to basically kind of randomly supplement your moves with like rolling or dodging and attacking. So if you don't have the ability to physically input it fast enough, we can at least recognize like, hey, you're in danger because there's scary music. Let's try to maybe roll and dodge and attack. Um, and so I, it didn't work basically. And what I learned was Dark Souls is really hard. Um, and we need to come back to that later. So those are the sort of first L's that I took uh, on this journey. And so I, th I thought, well, you know, Dark Souls, notoriously the hardest game, definitely the hardest problem to solve. Let, let me go to the next game I like to play. So I was sitting, you know, at, at this computer right here playing uh, Call of Duty with some of my friends. And I thought, well, what if I could just yell at Call of Duty and it, and it would work? Because I yell at it all the time. I rage at people, accuse everyone of hacking. And even though I'm just like not really good at the game um, and like, you know, everyone is, is cheating. It's never my fault. And I'm, I'm, you know, raging just like people do at video games. But like then I was just like, well, what if that what if that just actually did the things that I'm yelling at my computer to do? Um, and my first instinct was this is my favorite thing to say whenever I'm getting shot at in the game. It's just yelling serpentine, serpentine, where you're sort of dodging and going back and forth. But what if that could like actually happen if I yell serpentine and it could actually help move my character? Right. Pretty cool. Uh, there's a couple things that we needed. Uh, we needed voice input. I work in, in voice AI. You know, this is this is sort of my specialty. Um, we need to be able to route requests from like a voice assistant to the actual computer. And we need to receive the events on that client machine and actually press the, the keys. So here's what that basically looked like. Uh, the user would talk to a device that could be a smart speaker like the ones back here if you look at my camera. Uh, it could be on their phone or whatever. It needs to then talk to a voice assistant service, which then needs to send the information about what the user said to my custom API. That API then needs to send that information to the client machine, right, to like a Windows client like this. Um, and then it needs to actually execute something in game. Um, now, the, the first version of what I did was using Alexa, uh, and I should probably make sure she's muted. She is, very cool. Mute your Alexas and your Google Assistants and your Bixby devices, please. This is your, your only warning before I start triggering them. Um, 
anyway, I wanted to be able to use Alexa to say like, you know, reload or attack or jump uh, to do that in the game. Um, and so here's essentially what it looked like. I had an ASP.NET Core API. I had a single endpoint in here that was just called handle request. It got the skill request from the Alexa service, right? So this is in that custom API bucket. Um, and what we do is say like, well, if we get an intent request, let's extract what the intent is and then send that information down over SignalR uh, using this, you know, warzonehub.clients.all, just send async, and we're just sending the intent name. So if I say reload, it should hit the reload intent and we should send that over SignalR to any and all clients that are connected uh, to then do something with it. And then on the, other side of it, in the Windows client in UWP, uh, I was connecting to that same SignalR hub, uh, which was hosted in Azure, just on an Azure app service. And then when I say, you know, I got the armor intent, choose which key to press. Um, I was able to test this out. I put a, you know, spun up a notepad, ran it, saw the, the numbers and stuff start happening uh, and showing up in my little notepad. I was like, all right, let's get into the game and let's try it out. So I hop into Warzone. And I say, you know, Alexa, tell Warzone controller to shoot, hoping that it would be like, shoot, great, super awesome, fast. So I, I say it to the device and nothing happens. Weird. Even worse, I, the game was crashing all the time. Like it would just like shut down. And I was like, oh, my gosh, does Activision think I'm like hacking or something? Because I'm using like virtual inputs using some of the Windows APIs. Like, do they think I'm trying to create some sort of mod or hack? And I'm like getting like shadow banned and it's just crashing the game. What I ended up learning uh, is that you cannot run a Visual Studio debugger while you are playing any Battle.net game. Just for future reference, if you're ever like, okay, I'm going to go take a break while I'm debugging this console app that's running some worker, and I'm going to go, you know, it's it's 9 p.m., I'm going to go play Call of Duty or play Overwatch or something. The second you you try to open the game, it's just going to keep crashing. Reach out to my friends on the Visual Studio team, reach out to my friends at Activision, I was like, what the heck is going on? Why does it crash? No one had any idea. Uh, someone suggested that basically they're both trying to compete for some resource in the, the Windows registry and that they conflicted and the game basically lost to Visual Studio. But fun fact, if you, that ever happens to you, you're not alone. I, I went through it, uh, which means that we got another L along the way. So I was like, all right, well, what other games, right? We know the concept works. I'm seeing it type in Notepad. I can see the things that I'm saying type a key input onto my Notepad. So the first thing I thought was like, well, maybe it's a Call of Duty issue. Something's weird. Maybe I'm getting banned. Who knows? Let's go try some other games. Went back to Dark Souls. That didn't work. Went to Sekiro. That didn't work. It's also the same engine. That was a, a stupid second choice. Uh, and someone recommended this web browser game called Krunker. And that kind of worked, which was interesting. So games in the browser worked, but these sort of full screen viewed games just weren't working at all. So that didn't work. Uh, along the way, there were some other things we tried. You know, when I, I first gave this talk, people were like, well, if you actually just did WPF and send keys, that would work. Or like actually WinForms is able to get around that with send keys. You should use an extended background task in UWP so it keeps the foreground even though the game's running. Or you should create a USB over IP device. Uh, we tried it all. We did this on stream. We literally tried every single thing. We spent like six hours trying to just fight with any type of way to use a virtual input to just press the key because we got all the way there and it didn't work. And, and what we, you know, I sort of came to the conclusion of was like, well, the only thing that works is if I actually plug in a keyboard, any keyboard or a mouse or whatever, and press a key, it works. So what is the difference between what I'm doing here and there? And, and basically came to the conclusion that I need real USB devices and HID protocol, which is the human interface device protocol. that has been the same since like the 1980s. Uh, for keyboards. So I was introduced to this lovely little device uh, by a friend who recommended it to me called the Arduino Leonardo. I've got one here on my camera. This is the this is all reliable. Um, now the, the Leonardo is interesting. If you've never used Arduino before, it's uh, it's it's a microcontroller. It's got a tiny tiny single core CPU. Uh, actually, it might be a two core CPU. Now I don't know. Um, it has a single micro USB port over here on the the top left. It's got a whole bunch of pins that you can uh, attach headers to and, and do things and like send data to. But what's unique about the Leonardo and is not true for all microcontrollers and, and not true for other um, Arduinos even, is that it this port is able to act as an actual HID uh, recognized USB protocol port while also being able to receive commands over serial. 
Now, serial is the ability to send basically raw strings that are, you know, encoded into a certain set of bytes and come back back on the other side is another set of raw strings and they, you give it commands. It's just sort of one of the original ways that we worked with communicating between two completely external devices uh, before the USB protocol really came into action. So this is the first device that I found that could actually, I could write code, right? It's on our Arduino device. I can deploy basically C-ish code onto this thing. I can communicate to it over serial by sending information to it, and it can send real USB keyboard information back. Um, so, oh yeah, these are just you know the the things that I just explained. Uh, so here's the updated diagram, right? Same thing. User talks to a device, an Alexa speaker in this case. It talks to the Alexa system that sends information to my custom ASP.NET Core API. I send that over SignalR to any Windows client that's connected, and then it is sending a serial command to the Arduino Leonardo. And the Arduino Leonardo is actually pressing USB keys, essentially, by sending uh, the, the HID-based little byte array uh, to the computer to read so that the computer thinks this is an actual keyboard and that it actually pressed keys. But I'm actually talking to my Alexa device. Uh, and that worked. We were able to do a couple of different things uh, in the game, basic stuff. It was pretty slow, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but we were actually able to talk to an Alexa device and, and use it to command the game. So I hit this sort of point like, okay, maybe something there is something is there, right? We have that step of a working piece of software and a little bit of hardware now too. So the next thing that I usually do when trying to build a solution, and then once I get to that step of, of working software, is to confirm the the actual purpose, you know, make sure that 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 set of rules that like it doesn't just work for me and that it actually helps people uh, is actually accounted for. And so we we end up in our next stage in the journey, which is going from working software to a real product. And the way to validate this stuff is to go look at what else is out there. What are other people using to solve this problem already, if anything? Uh, so there's a lot of existing tools out there. I think the most notable specifically for gaming is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. I have one here. It's really cool. Um, I got to talk a lot with the the creator of it, or the co-creator of it, Bryce Johnson. Um, it's a really interesting device. So there's literally two gigantic buttons that are oh, satisfying click actuation. I don't know if you can hear that in the mic. Oh, it's so nice. But instead of having joysticks and buttons in a controller fashion, it has a whole bunch of ports on the back. And you can mount it with these little mount screws, but you now have to actually supply some sort of button or something that is going to plug into this device. And then you can replace things like the A button, the B button, the right trigger, stuff like that, with anything that you want. So you buy this device for you know 100 bucks or whatever it is, and then you gotta buy one of these, which is a kit. This one is from Logitech uh, that has a whole bunch of different switches and things that you then plug into your Xbox adaptive controller and now you've got these custom little buttons, not as satisfying, that you can just swap in and out. And then you can mount these and, and you know Velcro them to whatever other thing you have, um, and, and you can do a whole lot with it. And Xbox coming out with this tool completely changed how people were able to play games for people with disabilities. Um, you know, Being able to uh, make use of, of what they have available to them physically, uh, to be able to play games with their friends that otherwise would not be as accessible because the Xbox controller uh, if you're not familiar with it, this little guy here uh, is it's small, it's compact. You, you have to move, you know, basically two fingers and two thumbs, and that's what you have at your disposal. If you don't, then you're kind of on your own to figure it out. And it created another alternative that was, you know, relatively approachable pricing wise. Um, there are some other tools out there as well, specifically on the Xbox and Windows gaming side of things. Like the Xbox has Cortana built into it. You can use voice commands with Cortana to navigate around. Uh, you can use co-gaming, which is basically two people plugging in their controller, and that could be an Xbox adaptive controller or just an Xbox controller, and play as the same person with those two different devices. Online games often have things like skill-based matchmaking, so that if you're not as fast-paced and, and crazy and absolutely cracked out as some other people, uh, you're not going to be put in the same match with them. You're going to be put in the same sort of match or lobby as people who play at your skill level. And then other games will have difficulty settings. But the main thing to note is that not every game even has these things. Dark Souls doesn't have a game difficulty setting. Some of them have a game have a setting to make it even more difficult than the already challenging baseline, uh, which continue to prove that you know the, the issue is still there. I also got to talk with some amazing organizations in gaming accessibility, like Able Gamers, 
the cerebral uh, cerebral uh, cerebral palsy foundation. Sorry, uh, special effect out of the UK and warfighter engaged who work with uh, disabled veterans to play games, um, and learn that yeah, this issue exists. People want to be able to play games, and and certain games are simply not possible to play. And Dark Souls continues to be the poster child of of the non accessible games. Um, so after showing them the type of solution and, and validating the concept of like, hey, would this help your users and your your players that you work with on setting things up like the Xbox adaptive controller and and understanding that even with those other tools, the problem still exists, meant that there was a purpose. Um, so the next thing to do is to scale that prototype. In its current state, uh, oh, no, and also, by the way, this next like scale prototype, it's it's all on GitHub. Uh, it's, it was called Swab Keys because, uh, you know, I'm Swab Pirate, so naturally. Uh, from the Windows client to like all the extensions and stuff we'll talk about, it's all up there. Uh, okay, so this is our original diagram. One user, that's me, one device, my speaker, one voice assistant service, only worked on Alexa, my custom API to signal R to any Windows client technically, which really only worked for me, uh, and it worked for a couple different games, which is cool, um, with like basic inputs, but I had to go like custom write code for each game that I wanted to support. Uh, so we needed to be able to have the platform work for more than just me, right? Anyone should be able to get in there and use it. It needs to work on whatever devices they have available, not just my one little smart speaker in the corner. It needs to work with many different voice services. It needs to support everyone's individual Windows client, and it needs to work with every game that people want to play. So let's break this down. Let's talk about how we, we start scaling these individual components. And I'm going to start by talking about how we support more platforms, both on the client side and on uh, the voice assistant side. So I just used Voiceify for the voice assistant side because that's what I do all day. And I was like, well, I'm not going to custom build these anymore. I might as well throw it in Voiceify. Easy peasy. For the client side, I use Xamarin uh, in order to build the UI and all the business logic once. So I was able to take requests on Windows. It started to work. I was able to get it to work on Mac, on Android and iOS. So you could configure everything uh, regardless of what platform of choice you have. Uh, all built from a single code base with Xamarin, which is pretty cool. OK, so now we need to support more users and not just more platforms. And the way we do that is by adding authentication and authorization. And when it comes to this type of diagram, I need to authenticate and validate the user on both sides. So I need to know who the user is that's talking to the voice service. And I also need to know who the user is that's connecting from the Windows client and make sure that they're the same person before I send the thing that they said to that device. Because in the original say you may have remembered it said, you know, signal our hub dot clients dot all and send this intent. Um, we want to be able to send it to a specific user. So we need to set up these sort of authorization walls on both sides. So when you to do the login from the Xamarin side, right on the mobile app side or on the desktop app side, uh, there's a really cool new newish set of tools, I guess the last few years, uh, in Xamarin Essentials, which allows you to just take any OAuth based authentication supply some credentials and be able to sign in via the website and eventually get your authorization code back to then switch out for a token, uh, which means that we were able to implement authentication once using this library in literally like five lines of code. And I'll show you that in a second um, to authenticate. Authenticating a voice service is different. Uh, so this diagram is pulled from Alexa uh, in their developer docs. And you go through this process called account linking. So conceptually, I needed to build an identity service in my own server. Uh, I needed to allow people to sign up. They can sign in from the mobile app, great. But now how do you actually like sign in in a smart speaker? Um, the way this works is essentially um, this gross flow where the voice assistant will send a response back and say, hey, I need you to sign in. And the Alexa device specifically will say, I sent a card to your Alexa app uh, to link your account. So now the user needs to go to their Alexa app on their I, uh, iPhone or Android device, go sign in in the web, just like you do from your own mobile app that, that we talked about using Xamarin, and then it will then send all the redirect information back to Amazon uh, to be able to then handle the tokens from there with this really gross flow. But in the end, the implementation is, is really simple. If you have set up authentication using OAuth 2.0 with auth code grant flow, then you can just send your information to Amazon and, and add your, you know, your access uh, or your uh, client ID, client secret, you know, your URLs that you're going to use, uh, and it can allow you to authenticate. It's really simple now, but what's actually happening behind the scenes is, is kind of gross. So on the server side, we created user tables in SQL. We home rolled OAuth. Um, I went through this process of trying to get it to work with Okta. I was having issues with it with Alexa. 
Uh, so I was like, oh, you know, this might just be a good opportunity to, to while I was streaming on Twitch, show people how to implement OAuth from scratch, which if you haven't done that before, that's a nightmare. Um, but we did it. And then what you end up doing is in the .NET space is telling your API how to authorize a request once you have a JWT or a JOT uh, for the authenticated user. So you go through the process of signing in or creating a user account, and in the end, you get an access token, and you need to send that access token on every HTTP request over um, the authorization header with the bearer, and that's what all this setup is. You, you, you register, you're going to use bearer authentication, so that way you can start to add authorization to specific endpoints. So we can say, if you're going to hit any endpoint from the mobile app, these are the ones that you can only hit if you're authorized, which means you have to send a valid access token. And basically the same thing from the Alexa service, although it won't send it in the header. You have to take it out of the body, which is kind of gross. Uh, so from the mobile app side, this is the that short little, so I guess it's more than five lines of code. I'm sorry, I lied. Uh, for authenticating and getting that access token uh, using the Xamarin Essentials Web Authenticator class. So basically you can create a state object, uh, get your client ID out of your settings somewhere, make a request using that web authenticator class and the URL that you have, where you pass it the client ID and your state and what your redirect URL is, or URI. You then uh, basically handle the response that comes back from the await. It's all happening behind the scenes by actually then opening the browser, letting you sign in when you've successfully signed in. That auth result will be filled with successful information. You can then pull the code property out of it, confirm that the state matches, and then you need to take that authorization code and get the actual access token, which you can do by making a request against your access token endpoint. And then if you're good, you've got an access token, you are an authorized user, you can now use that to make requests against the API going forward, which means that on the Alexa side, you can sign in and we know who you are. And now on your desktop app or your mobile app, wherever the information is being sent, you can sign in and we know who you are. So both sides of the, those walls are, are solved. The next thing to do is be able to support more games and to be able to customize and personalize what the controller should do based off what you say. Because before we had to go build a custom Alexa skill for every single thing that someone was saying. And to be able to say, like, if I say jump, it should be the space bar in Minecraft. But if I say uh, double jump in Sekiro, it should hit the space bar twice. Like, how do we control and, and customize from there? So I started with just this basic concept of keyboard profiles. You pick a key. And then you give it a list of comma separated commands. And like, if you say these things, we will hit that key. And, and that's basically as far as it went. Uh, but now we were able to sign into Alexa, sign into the mobile app or, or desktop app, use the desktop app to create these profiles, and then say, when I say jump, hit the space bar. And now you can talk to your Alexa device and say, uh, you know, Alexa, tell swap keys to press jump. Lot to say, uh, but it ends up coming together pretty nicely. So the next thing to do is to make it a little bit more uh, accessible and add some new features. So we did things like adding macros, the ability to do multiple keyboard events back to back based off one command. So this is where we added that double jump concept, um, where if you say double jump, we're going to hit the space bar, then wait for 500 milliseconds, then hit the space bar again. Because you can't just hit it back to back, you know, with like 10 milliseconds in between. It won't register. It'll think you just did it once. We also added action queuing, which is the ability to take all of the string of what someone said and queue up multiple actions to happen. So if I say jump, 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 at the end of it, it's gonna go, oh, we heard jump three times, we should hit the space bar three times. So what it looks like in the UWP side, or, or really in any of the .NET side, to send that command information to the Arduino Leonardo that I showed before when it's plugged in, basically looks like this. You get the key phrase, so what is the command or what is the thing that we should be pressing? And how long should we hold the key for in milliseconds or null? And we'll just sort of default to 50 or something. Uh, we then create a data writer object and we take this string, right? So there's press key phrase and, and your hold time milliseconds. So in the end, what we're doing is basically sending that string, like press space for 500 to the Arduino. And then in our Arduino code, we're able to process that command and say every time we get the press command, meaning that's the first part of that string, then we should go run this function called press key command, which I broke up a little bit to try to fit on a slide. Uh, and it looks like this. So we, we get the next argument, right? So we have that, that press space 500. So the next argument would be space. Everything that's ironically space separated means that it's a different command in the serial request. So now we have press, we're in this press key command, we have space, we know that the arg should be space. If we have a number as the third argument, that 500, 
uh, then we'll be able to use it. Uh, and then we should you know, actually press the key that was in the command. So now we need to prove that it really works. And I did this in a couple of ways. Uh, I wanted to prove that it's something that's extensible and that can work in a lot of games and that can actually help people. Um, and I did this in, in two ways. The, the, the main ways that I did it was running and, and competing in hackathons. Uh, so I created Suave Keys and submitted it to the Microsoft Azure US Hack for Accessibility and the Azure AI Hackathon. Got second place in both, absolutely robbed, unfair. Um, and basically what that final architecture looked like was this. I was able to have the mobile app again built in Xamarin, but use Azure Cognitive Services for the voice request rather than using Alexa for it, or be able to use both at the same time if I wanted to use Alexa or if I wanted to talk to my Windows app. Same exact route, right? It goes to the API, it sends a signal our request, it hits the desktop app. We check it against the profile that you've built. Maybe it's a macro, maybe it's just pressing a key, and then we execute that in game because it's being sent to the Arduino. Um, and finally, our first live demo with a little bit of violence here in Sekiro, uh, where we're able to show some of this stuff off. And then the one thing I want to just sort of note is the just awful, awful delay from when I say something to when it actually happens. All right, hopefully it continues on the one we just did and not our new game plus four. Attack. Cool, two seconds. Ooh. Block. Ooh, attack. Attack. Ooh, that was actually done in time. Attack. 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 So the move, uh, basically my rules for that little demo was I'm only going to use my thumbs on the joysticks for movement. Wasn't going to be allowed to attack or block with anything but my voice. And we successfully defeated the very first enemy you ever face after uh, nearly dying. So the delay was, was definitely a challenge, but it worked. I mean, we were able to actually send a request, talk to the device and, and see it executed. The next thing I did was uh, submit it to this Snapchat hackathon because I wanted to show how the concept could be extended to more than just your voice. Uh, so I had this really interesting concept when the SnapKit developer challenge came out. And, and if you've ever used Snapchat, you're probably wondering like, well, how did you use Snapchat to send commands? And I'll tell you, a really, really gross and hacky workaround. So you are using the Snapchat mobile app and we created a custom lens in Snapchat they have a really cool, like, like almost like a Unity, like 3D plane editor that you can use for Snapchat. It's it's really, really awesome to try. And I recommend trying it out if you're a Snapchat user. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, but we can't just like send a web request. Like we can't make an HTTP request from Snapchat. That, that would be pretty, uh, pretty scary if you could as a third party developer. But what I could do was flash a QR code on the screen where you're using Snapchat. So then what I, I did was created another Windows app, a totally separate one called the Snap Reader. And you can find this all on GitHub too. I have links towards the end to share with uh, all this stuff out. And it used a library called Zebra Crossing that can read QR codes and barcodes and things like that. And so what it did was took the stream from my phone. So if you plugged your phone into the computer and then started the app, you could go through like the screen share functionality, just like I just did here to share my screen in Teams. Literally same modal, same thing that pops up. And you just select that you wanna stream your phone. And so then it, what it was doing is taking every frame of the video stream and checking to see if there was a QR code. If it found the QR code, then it sent the command. So we set up QR codes for like, if I raise my eyebrows, if I showed bull horns, if I smiled, if I opened my mouth, if I showed a fist or like a, a, a single finger in the air. And each of those just flashed a different QR code uh, that then was processed and then sent the command. Now that's really fast in, 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 in terms of how it actually worked out. So I, I've got another little video here of doing that in Fall Guys. Um, shout out to Olga and your Snapchat lenses. Uh, here are a couple different ones where you have it on my face on the right and then my actual phone on the left where you can see the QR code starting to flash. But let me play this out. It says that I think it did it too fast and we basically like crashed the game. Um, oh no. <laughs> I think that would type an M, by the way, which I don't know if that's wired or anything. Google <laughs> CEO, oh, great. <laughs> Every time I take a drink, I'm gonna have to like keep my coffee down here so I don't have to use my hands. So I'll be like. All right, this is a good one. 
I gotta like, I'm gonna end up like doing like this and like punching my coffee. All right, we're playing one-handed. So I'm gonna keep my other hand here so I can just be like real quick. Just to see if it's working. I'm gonna use my eyebrows. A little jump, a little fist, jump. There's the jump dive. All right, we're off and running. Double jump. Please. So I was able to process that stuff pretty close to real time. I don't know if you noticed, but like from eyebrow raise to the QR code flashing was really fast because Snapchat is, has really good face recognition to the actual process being run in the game. The only latency is on the HTTP request in the WebSocket connection from SignalR, and SignalR is crazy fast. So it felt in close to real time, and we got under basically 80 milliseconds from starting to raise my eyebrows or starting to smile, or in these cases showing hand signs, to actually affecting the game, which is pretty close to how fast uh, non-gaming keyboards are even uh, with detecting input sometimes. The next thing I did was uh, built an integration with Twitch uh, where I would also have another Windows app uh, for the bot where you would authenticate against Twitch and basically it was reading Twitch chat the whole time so that anyone that wanted to type exclamation point press in some command would try to run that command uh, against the, the profile that's set up. So if you typed exclamation point press jump, it would be the same as me hitting the space bar. Uh, which was pretty cool to be able to build something that, like, if you wanted to jump into Teams chat and start typing things that you wanted to do um, in in my game or in my PowerPoint, that's essentially what we were going for. So we're using this, right, the Twitch chat and the Snapchat use case and the voice you, uh, inputs and our hands on the, the keyboard and mouse all at the same time uh, in this uh, quick little video of Call of Duty. Uh, I did cut this one short because it, it does it, it it's pretty grotesque in terms of the amount of video game violence, but uh, I'll talk through some of the things that happen here. But the main thing to look is at the chat in the top in the bottom right above my face, uh, you'll see where people are sending all sorts of commands. Maybe these. Someone give me a no scope. How's the delay on chat now? Now it's open reload. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Come on. Oh, here we go. And one second cut before Doom. Uh, so, little thing on the bottom right, someone said press jump, and my guy did a little hop. You can also see the whole history of people trying to throw grenades and, and shoot and stuff like that, too. Uh, which combining all these things together now, right, where I'm using my voice commands, you, you heard me say that I, you know, I had opened my mouth to reload my gun in the game uh, while also allowing Twitch chat to work and still having whatever I can use physically on a mouse and keyboard or a controller sort of gave me the realization that uh, there's something really there. And more than that, I learned that it was really fun to use to, even as someone without any physical disabilities, to be able to play games in new ways and just kind of interact with with my games and in, in ways that weren't just pressing buttons and moving my mouse um, was interesting and it actually really helped people I had a few people try it out uh, that found it really especially the snapchat one which is a whole rigmarole to, to get working um, found it extremely useful and so what I learned with something really being there is that it needed to be something that other people could use uh, without having to install Snapchat and uh, all these ridiculous things. And so I started the more formal uh, enabled play. And to go from prototype to production, there were still a few key issues that needed to be solved. And uh, those were performance issues. If you remember from that Sekiro sample, me saying attack and then it being like, what, three seconds later where it actually swung the sword, it's not actually viable in any realistic use case. Uh, privacy, when you're talking to your Alexa device or you're talking to the, the app and it's sending every single thing you say to Azure Cognitive Services, all your audio is going to somewhere else. Uh, price, so while an Arduino Leonardo is super cheap and that's the basis for the hardware, uh, it got really expensive for me to run it. And I don't know if you've ever used something like Cognitive Services or any like image recognition or, or like basically cloud-hosted machine learning model. If you're running that model and constantly hitting it with like every frame of a video or or everything someone is saying to try to process speech to text um and you scale that to you know let's say like a thousand people you're basically going to be paying like tens of thousands of dollars every month which 
the only way to make that even work would be to put the cost back on the user who's using it, and that's just not uh, sustainable. And then the last thing is to be able to actually scale it uh, to be able to be more flexible. I was running it on a free Azure app service, which was great for prototyping, but it needed to scale to something more. So let's talk about the performance stuff first. Uh, and specifically, I'll start with voice, because that's where the real issue lied uh, with being able to say commands and have them, them happen in your app. Uh, so this is what a standard standard sort of natural language processing or, or speech recognition process looks like. We detect that that the audio has started. That can be from pressing a button or it can be something in the background that says, hey, let's open up the mic and start listening and taking those little audio buffers. Uh, we then need to record all those audio buffers into one big chunk and send that information to a third party to detect the speech. And that needs to happen on a cloud service. So we need to run all the recording and then send it to somewhere else and then get the information back and then be able to actually process the speech and send commands. So SignalR was fast. The ability to, to send it to Arduino and then hit the key was incredibly fast. It was like uh, nanoseconds. But recording the audio and then even sending it to, to Azure Cognitive Services was pretty fast. But there was a core issue with we have to wait for you to basically finish talking before we send your audio to be processed. So what I started to do was work on a new way to model speech recognition that's more predictive. Uh, and what that basically looks like is that the audio is always on. There's nothing that needs to say, hey, please start listening. We were just always recording. Um, we're always listening and recording that in chunks and processing the partial speech components uh, that are happening. So every time you're saying something, it's building on itself. And we can dispose of the audio stream continuously and do it offline uh, directly on the device. So we can't do that on an Arduino Leonardo, which means we needed uh, you know, new hardware. And so what that's evolved into now is, is a Raspberry Pi, which is a more of a proper uh, multi-core you know, single board computer, which can do a whole lot of stuff. And now what it is in production is this little tiny Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4, which has a four core processor, up to eight gigs of, of RAM, more than enough to run a speech model. Uh, and then you combine that with the carrier board and on-device uh, microphones, and you're able to start actually talking to the physical device and have it do things. And your audio is never sent anywhere else, right? We're not sending it to cognitive services or to Amazon or to Google or somewhere to process the speech to text. It's happening entirely offline, uh, which keeps it private as well. But on the performance side, you know, that jump, jump, jump performance that we talked about before, with action queuing, the fastest I ever got it to happen was 1.5 seconds, where I, I cut down, like, if you're not talking for basically 10 milliseconds, then we're, we're going to consider that, that you're done talking, go send it to the third party, process it, and queue up all the actions. But with the predictive natural and offline natural language processing and speech recognition, we're able to run that predictively, meaning that I know that you're going to say jump before you've even pronounced the P sound at the end of jump because I'm confident enough based off the profile you've built and how you've personalized it to hit the space bar, which means when you say jump, 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 it's happening every 10 milliseconds, essentially, if you're saying it really fast, uh, which means we can get up to three times hit in 30 milliseconds, which is faster than an actual keyboard. And uh, I guess I already talked about the, the privacy side of it, where we're not actually sending your speech anywhere, which means it also is something that we don't have to pay for. We don't have to pay for Azure Cognitive Services to constantly be streaming thousands of people's audio at all times and processing their speech, um, which allows us to basically keep all the information private, uh, be able to uh, allow the user to confidently turn on their mics and, and not have to worry about paying for it the entire time either. Um, which I guess I already sort of talked through these on the other ones, but uh, the same thing also applies for online expression detection. So, you know, I showed in the, the Snapchat demo, it's super fast. And the reason why is because Snapchat is processing your face position and what are called facial landmarks offline in real time, uh, which means that it knows where your eyes are, where the edge of your face is, all the different points around your lips, uh, where your eyebrows are, where your shoulders are, where your fingers are, and it's processing that offline. Uh, they were honestly probably one of the first people to pioneer that type of technology in a native mobile app, even before you know iPhones had you know four cores in their CPU. Um, and that same technology is is now more broadly adopted by other players. And so we're able to take that and do it ourselves and put it in our own mobile app, where we can make use of your own phone's camera, uh, where we don't have to send your video stream online, uh, which means that we also. Uh, don't have to worry about paying for Azure Cognitive Services again. So basically taking all the stuff that was really expensive, all the things that had privacy concerns and performance issues, minifying them, personalizing them, 
and putting them uh, directly on the devices that are sort of the closest to you. And what that final platform looks like is this. Uh, we have a single API that's you know split across many different servers that is is honestly very basic. It does authorization and authentication. You can create profiles for your different games and apps you want to use, and that's all just stored in PostgreSQL. Um, this is actually all in Mongo now, uh, a little bit outdated. Swap PostgreSQL for Mongo, so it's even easier to scale. Still using SignalR to send information back and forth from the API to the mobile app, and also sending from SignalR directly uh, the request to the device itself. So rather than having to run a Windows app in the background, you just plug in your device. It tells the computer you're on that it's a keyboard. Um, and we can send requests directly to it because it's itself connected to the internet and or connected over Bluetooth to your phone uh, where you're setting everything up. And just like the Arduino Leonardo, it's sending real HID and USB commands uh, to your device. So we're able to just start saying commands and using facial expressions and all sorts of other things that I'm going to demo in just a sec. So now what this looks like, please slides, um, is a couple different endpoints to start telling the device what to do rather than just sending commands to the device over serial. So here's, for example, an ASP.NET Core endpoint uh, to tell a device to start listening. So you supply from the mobile app the ID uh, by just making this HTTP POST request. We verify that, your, that it belongs to you, so you can't tell other people's devices to start listening like a creep. Uh, and then we're going to connect to all of the, uh, or to the one device that has that ID and just send it the command of start listening. Uh, from the mobile app side where we're invoking that, it's a simple post request. We are literally just taking the ID and sending that post request. And then on the Python side, I told you you weren't going to get away without any Python. We connect to the SignalR hub and we add these handlers. So when we get start listening, we should just call the function that says start listening, which spins up the, the speech recognition model. It also will then send information back to the API still over SignalR from the device itself to say, hey, I am listening, or hey, something went wrong and I, I need to stop listening. So now in the SignalR side, on the server, we're able to process that request from the, the device that it came from and say like, hey, are we still listening or not? Um, and then send it back to the user that the device belongs to, which means that from my app, I can tap a button that says start listening. If I unplug my device, the app is gonna know that, I, that I'm no longer listening because the thing doesn't have any power. So that basically translates to how we can send all sorts of commands back and forth from the mobile app. And again, I, I know I'm sort of talking through all these conceptually. I'm going to show you them in a live demo momentarily. Uh, but it, it ends up creating a really simple setup where I, I just have an API that is able to handle SignalR connections using Azure. Uh, it, I can spin up as many of them as I need for as many users as I need. It doesn't cost me very much at all because hosting a, a simple server that doesn't do a whole lot, I can scale as many as I want for pretty cheap. Not a whole lot of data I have to store because I don't want all your personal data. Uh, and we're able to actually build something that runs almost entirely offline uh, and in some cases can, can run entirely offline so that you can use it anywhere. The last thing on this sort of like, uh, you know, journey of building this device and, and, and these apps that I wanted to, to emphasize that like it's really just a, a core thing that I've, I've seen in the process of building products. Uh, is that sometimes you you set out to solve a specific problem. In my case, that was I was trying to build a bot that could help you play Dark Souls, essentially. Um, and finding out that it actually solves other problems along the way. And this this is incredibly true with what happened with Enable Play, where I built it for gaming. I built it for Dark Souls to make it easier. Um, and when people started using it and and starting to to understand what it did, I I learned that the issue is far beyond gaming uh, and that people with certain, especially physical disabilities, but also cognitive disabilities have a hard time just using computers. And, and the underlying reason is that the keyboard and mouse or the touchscreen on your phone, uh, or, or even in some cases, voice like on services like Alexa is not built for everyone. It is built for people that can use them. Um, and so when we start to use technology at a young age and we're limited in in using these tools to talk to our computers uh if it's not easy then you're going to have problems through the rest of your life essentially in terms of using technology and so i started working with schools uh to introduce these devices to students that needed them to use their their computers to do things like their homework or to study more easily to automate common tasks that would otherwise be difficult with a mouse and keyboard uh, or a, a trackpad or even a touchscreen. 
Um, and this is where it's become, I think, the most powerful. While it's great to be able to play games, uh, it's now a tool that's out there helping students in, in different schools uh, learn technology and, and not fall behind and, and fall into that sort of compounding issue that exists simply because keyboards aren't for everyone. Um, that's sort of the, the main stuff that I wanted to go through before jumping into demos. I want to show you the real app. I want to show you the real devices like this little guy here that's currently plugged into my computer. Uh, and I want to show you that in a couple of games. And then uh, I want to show you that in a couple of other apps like Visual Studio Code as well. So I have a question for everyone here. Uh, and the question is, which you can answer in chat, how much violence do you want in the video game demo? With one being no violence, all the way up to five being like, please play Call of Duty. Put it in chat. Let me see what you want. Five. <laughs> Elden Ring violence. Elden. I don't have Elden Ring yet. <laughs> Ten. Olga, you're a monster. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do some violent stuff. All right. Let me let me let me uh, set some stuff up. Um, and yeah, I uh, yeah, I remember fun times last Friday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a warning. Don't judge my ability to play. I'm not very good. Uh, okay, so real quick, here's the app. Uh, this is Enable Play. It looks so much nicer than that old, like, crappy keyboard style. Um, there's a couple new things, and and even if you've seen this talk before, um, there's there's a lot of new stuff that you can do. Uh, so I talked about expression controls and voice controls. There's also stuff, which, by the way, I was literally using the entire time. You see I have a profile here called PowerPoint uh, that I was using because I had little hotkeys here that I could tap to go next and back on the slide, so I didn't even have to use my keyboard. Uh, I also have it set up so that I can uh, tilt my phone to go back and forth between slides. So I have uh, the ability to use tilt controls. So I don't know if you can really see this while it's a little shaking dot. I'm going to try to also pull my phone up into camera view. If you hold your camera, your, your phone flat, essentially as I tilt it left and tilt it right and, and forward and down, uh, it's able to recognize when it sort of breaks that barrier. Uh, that that should be a command. So one of the things I was also doing, because this is Loki testing it out and making sure that my latest dev bits that I have on my phone were still going to work, uh, was picking up my phone every now and then and tilting it right to actually go to the next slide, which is pretty cool. Um, you also have uh, the ability to do remote typing. So you can use your, your keyboard on your phone to actually type on your computers or on your consoles. So if you plug this into your Xbox or your PlayStation 5, instead of having to use the lame little like navigation with the joystick to each key, uh, to tap it, uh, we can actually like type here. Like if you're going to name your character or something, or like type your password in, uh, you can type it here uh, and have it actually type on the controller side as well. Again, we have that button to start and stop listening. You can switch your profiles on the fly. So right now I have it set to PowerPoint, but I can switch to, uh, for example, the Visual Studio ones, which I have for some demos uh, by just tapping it. Maybe if it's going to be nice and play well, please. I might need to restart the app. One second. Demo gods, be with me. Hottest dev bits. These things happen. Let's see. We are still connected. Please switch profiles to Visual Studio. There we go. Okay, sorry. Oh, now I'm not even showing it. Hey, hey Visual Studio. Right, so you can switch on the fly. Um, and now it has the the things that I want to use in Visual Studio. <laughs> yeah, if you want to play Among Us, there's the the amount of violence we really need. Um, and uh, some other things that are coming out soon is the ability to use uh, controller outputs. So right now the profiles are focused mostly around uh, different key inputs, uh, but you can basically choose what type of command you want to, to run what type of, of input to your computer. So for example, I can say I want to use a face expression, and if I start smiling, or if I say um, uh, hello or something, I don't know, let's add some other variations, then I want to either press a key or button or I want to run a macro. And when you run macros, it's the same thing, right? You, you're chaining events. So you can say, I want to type this, then wait, then press this key, then wait and do all this sorts of stuff back to back all with one command, which is really nice for uh, even doing things like in this Visual Studio profile I have, which I'm just going to back all the way out for you to see, uh, is like comment can just type slash slash as a macro. Right, so I have like function, and it should just type function. So I can have a button that I can press to just type a function. Um, and then on the expression side, we are currently able to process um, head tilt directions, which is something that's new. And this is I was I was telling you earlier, Olga, that I was not able to demo before. So like for example, in, in the Snapchat samples way back when in the prototypes, like we could recognize eyebrows moving and, and mouth opening and 
uh, smiling and stuff like that, and then some hand gestures. But one of the things that I can do now, let me go into it, is uh, use my face, and you can tell when I, I stop smiling or start smiling how quick it is. I can also turn my head to different directions, like turn left, turn right. I can tilt it back. I can tilt it forward. Um, I can, uh, this won't show anything, but like raise my eyebrows or lower them or one or the other. I can wink and those will fire different commands. Um, and yeah, so combining all of these different things, I can have something set up where it could be as simple as when I turn my head to the right, go to the next slide, uh, which is exactly what we did in the, the PowerPoint side uh, as well. Or I can say if I'm playing a video game and I have my phone posted up here, that if I smile, it should be the same as jump. Uh, which means that now I can use my hands on a keyboard or mouse if, that, if that's available to me uh, to do certain commands while also being able to use my face and my voice and these macros uh, to be able to basically automate the rest. Um, so that's the quick version of the app and all the sorts of things that you can combine together, expression controls for your head positions and smiling and eyebrows raising and, and all that good stuff, tilt controls for using your phone as a way of input, uh, hotkeys, which are just buttons, so I can tap comment or tap function. Uh, I can remotely type messages. I can tell my device to start and stop listening, uh, and I can switch profiles whenever, and I can also connect to it over Bluetooth if I'm offline to be able to still do all these things even if I'm not connected to the Internet at all. Uh, so I've been using this now like every day while at work uh, for the voice of my team to know. I use I have like a, a, a separate profile set up where like I can just say build. Or there's, there's a lot of really interesting keyboard shortcuts and stuff like VS Code and in Visual Studio. One of the ones that uh, one of my coworkers always has to remind me of what it is until I turn it into a button was in Visual Studio and your Solution Explorer, if you're like in a file, is like opening your current files location in the Solution Explorer. So if you're like in some random, you know, like object like or class file or something like that, to be able to actually go to where it is in the folder structure, uh, I, I set it up where I just have a button that I, I just tap because I always forget the command. It's like control shift right brace or like commit or control K right brace or something like that, which like even with your hands on the keyboard is hard to do. Uh, so it's just pretty funny. So uh, automating stuff for myself, which is great. OK, let's go. Let's go play some video games. And we chose a lot of violence. So I'm going to go into Call of Duty, I think, unless someone has a different game they want to see. But I'm going to show you the some of the original demos that we did uh, for Warzone, but now with Enable Play. So give it a sec to launch up. Um, and in the meantime, I will take questions. You can un unmute your mic, jump in, or, or throw them in chat. And I can, you know, happy to go from here into depth on any of the other tech stuff because obviously I covered like a whole lot and really breezed over like, oh yeah, we did image recognition, you know, like you do. Um, but I wanted to make sure we got through the whole story. So if you have questions now while I'm booting up, feel free to, to ask away. Do, do you find that um, how much of an issue is it of sending un Commands that you didn't mean to send that you just happened to turn your head because it was a noise or you sneezed or whatever. No, yeah, it's a great question. Um, on the voice side of things, one of my focuses was on trying to identify like who the speaker was so that it wouldn't pick up background noise and also trying to balance like how ambitious it is in trying to recognize the words. And you can do some like sensitivity stuff uh, to make that a little bit easier. And then in terms of like tilting your head, um, you know, what I've found is like as a practice is like you should only really use expression controls in ways that you're or, or for things that are like not a big deal if you accidentally do. So like I wouldn't want to have it where if I smile, it shuts down my computer right away uh, because I'm going to be like, you know, randomly smiling. I could see something funny in, on like Twitter or something and smile and then, you know, it does something catastrophic. Um, the uh, the other side of it, I'm just going to go into plunder so I can respawn. And I'm going to go back so as to not play with strangers because I don't want people notoriously in Call of Duty lobbies saying stupid stuff while we're in a meetup. Also, just call out Still Swap Pirate. Uh, anyway, to continue to answer your question, um, the, the, the main thing that I see issues with in terms of like accidentally, like proactively firing a command um, is in those situations where like you get distracted or like you need to leave. Like if you have it where, you know, if I turn my head left and then I get up and get out of the chair while the camera's on me, it might pick up something. So the way to balance that is with sensitivity settings, like how far should I turn my head right or left before it triggers a command? That way, you know, even me right now, I'm looking between two monitors, like I can make it so it's as sensitive as this, uh, or I can make it so I need to turn my head, you know, all the way left or right. 
Uh, and then other than that, it's just like don't put don't bind very important commands to things that you know you might you might do accidentally. And then on the voice side for commands, you know, there's you could say a whole lot of different things. The vocab of it is is like some like 300,000 words that it recognizes. But the best practice that I found and have been talking through now with people using the devices is make your commands that matter uh, different enough from each other phonetically. Uh, so don't have lump and jump be two different commands because you have a chance of it recognizing the wrong one essentially. So make them separate sounding. Make them short enough where they're easy to say, but not so short that um, you know nothing works. And I just realized I don't have a profile set up for this, so I'm going to do that real quick. What other questions you guys got? Uh, you were mentioning uh, pretty often that we did it. Uh, so who else was working on that with you? Oh, <laughs> so in terms of development, it was just me. I keep saying we because all of the original prototypes were built um, with on Twitch when I was streaming on Twitch. So there's people in chat, uh, you know, throwing ideas and, and walking through things and asking questions and stuff. So I'm saying we, it's like, you know, there's people in chat sending commands and, and things like that. But no, uh, I, I am the only actual developer uh, in terms of, of building everything. Like it's kind of the royal we in that regard. There we go. There's your silence already. Okay, I'm I'm on on the side here, just trying to set up some basic commands to try out, uh, because I didn't have a profile on this account. But while we wait on all these loading screens, I am just down here in the app, trying to fly around. I used to have one of these that I used for demoing. Let's see. Sure cash by completing contracts, looting or eliminating. Here we go. We're saving. We're moving. One second. Jump. Pull the parachute. I don't have anything set up yet to cut the parachute, which is C. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to hit C on the keyboard, but then I'm going to say uh, the 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 J word that I use for the space bar that I don't want to say right now, uh, so you can see just how fast it is. So jump, and that's jump. Let's see. I think I have shoot, 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 shoot. It's pretty good. Sorry, my dog wants attention now too that he sees me playing games. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's I guess like the shortest version of a demo I can give. Um, I don't know how bad the frame rate is coming through the video too, but I'm sitting here now. I have I have a button that I'm tapping now to jump, uh, so I can sit here, you know, like on my phone and just... jump, jump, jump. <laughs> and it's free. Uh, but it's great. I mean, because it's just using keyboard inputs, you know, it, it recognizes my my device as an actual keyboard. Uh, it works on Mac, works on Windows, works on Xbox, and and also now works on PlayStation. Um, right now, only as a keyboard, uh, but eventually to be able to work as um, a controller as well. So you can, you know, if you use PlayStation, you don't use PC or or a Mac for gaming, then just go plug it into your PC and use it too, uh, and use it alongside your existing controllers. Right? Like I'm using my mouse right now. Uh, where I can I can hold right click to aim and I can still shoot by by tapping a button on my phone or by saying shoot, um, and and seeing just you know how quick it is shoot 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 shoot. That's no one landed on me, which is kind of sad because uh, I was hoping to be able to actually fight the people with it, but no one is here. Um, cool. One of the other things that I think is really cool that I've been working on now is to totally switch context. Uh, I've got a little sample JS here that I wanted to show is combining this tech with other really cool AI tools like GitHub Copilot. I don't know how many of you have used GitHub Copilot. If you have, let me know in chat um, if you've been able to get access to it. But it's able to basically write code for you based off of predictions and, and models that are trained around GPT-3 from OpenAI's Codex uh, project. What it allows me to do 
um, and I just I'm switching profiles here to to Visual Studio in the app uh, is go in and say comment. And it, oh, it's, okay, that's GitHub thinking I should write a whole bunch. Enemy team is tracking your function. Oop, oop, wiling out, wiling out. Tab. And it just took it because a tab is how you would take the suggestion there. So, you know, hands free being able to actually write code by using GitHub Copilot as its own assistive technology to be able to write code for me on my behalf without me having to type everything out. Well, of course, you know, use GitHub Copilot at your own discretion. It is reading your code uh, and is also trained on open source data. And then I think we all know how uh, well written certain open source things are. So, um, but in terms of making now coding more accessible or otherwise learning how to write JavaScript and uh, just as in, in this, you know, example is already challenging enough for some people uh, to be able to actually write so much and type as much as we do uh, as developers can be really hard and it stops people with disabilities that are that impede them from being able to use their keyboard as quickly from being able to do it or even just like if you're a slower typer like literally if you type at 50 percent the speed of another you are in theory less productive as a developer uh, so the, the main goal with this is to be able to get closer to that like what do I like at, at cognitively what do I need to do what am I trying to do with my computer and using whatever I have at my disposal my face my hands my voice uh, my my body positioning and things like that to actually control it and talk to it um, and it's something that that you know will make games more accessible by making it something that the only thing holding you back in theory should be your reaction um, and I think I just heard myself get absolutely shredded in the background um, yeah, so that's that's everything I want to show. I'm gonna jump out of Call of Duty because it's super loud. We didn't actually get as much violence as we wanted. I'm sorry for that. Um, last but not least, uh, where are we? Please, Alt Tab. Uh, you can get these devices now. They're available for pre-order. Um, where are my slides? Hello, hello, slides. PowerPoint is crashing. Whoop, whoop. You guys see what you're still seeing the same slide, aren't you? Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. Be really cool. Maybe PowerPoint also crashes if you play Call of Duty, just like Visual Studio does. <laughs> Here, let me uh, stop slideshow and try again. One sec. Sorry, everyone. Oh no! Spoilers for the resources tab. Um, what I was going to say is, is you can grab these devices now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be working on new developer tools for it to be able to extend it uh, that allows third-party developers to use OAuth to sign users in and send commands in your own way. So if you have other ways that you think would be useful to someone to be able to send a command, uh, you'll be able to do that too from uh, any client-side application. Uh, but the devices are available for pre-order. I'm limited right now by how much I can actually make because... Uh, you can't get any Raspberry Pi components until at least like May. Uh, but if you want to get your hands on one and try it for yourself, you can do that. You can follow the link or go to enableplay.com. All the stuff that I showed in terms of the open source projects, um, swap keys, the entire thing, the actual like Twitch bot setup, the Snapchat uh, integration, all of that is up on my GitHub. Um, and if you ever feel like watching me live, if once I get back to a regular streaming schedule, you can find me at twitch.tv slash swap pirate. And then the last thing I want to do i just show you this quick video in Dark Souls of us doing the unimaginable, which is parrying uh, a boss uh, without using our hands. So using our face to smile to parry, uh, which is, is pretty Is that uh, your brother, the second person? Uh, these are both me. Oh, <laughs> one both is my phone know. camera. <laughs> one, is, one is me with a Snapchat filter that makes my head really big. Uh, and the other one is me being very serious because I'm focused on the game. Oh, oh here we go. Oh, that frame rate is just awful. Here, you know what? Hey, Kenzie, what's up? Okay, we can still, let's try to smile to parry again. Oh, that was really close. Eyebrow raises to roll. We're gonna go for a smile parry. Oh! <gasps> And then I botch it, but still. No, it didn't do it. No, we actually parried him with our face, though. 
And then, of course, because it's still Dark Souls. Okay, we got uh, the parry. You, you still die. So that's everything I want to show you all today. Uh, thank you so much for joining, uh, especially in the evening after work. Uh, I know everyone, of course, always has a lot going on, but I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about um, you know, how I built Enable Play in, in this whole sort of journey from can I build a bot to help me play Dark Souls to you know, a, a device now that's helping kids learn how to code, essentially. Awesome job, Alex. Yeah, and, yeah, super cool. Yeah, just just don't tell my boss I was, you know, I was on my computer after hours and not actually working for the firm. <laughs> <laughs> right. He, he no promise. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes. So. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Oh, thanks, Alex. Hi, man. Good one. Yes, thank Have you very everyone. much. Bye. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Thank you, Jason. Stopping the recording. Yeah, thanks for presenting, man.